tonight's show. I'm Alexa. I'm the head of online community here at House Call Pro, and I'm your host for the Home Service Evening Update. I'm joined by my co-host, Roland. He's the co-founder of House Call Pro, and Mel, who is our senior vice president of people. You can think of us as your in-house marketing, business, and HR experts. So each evening at 5 p.m. Pacific time, Monday through Thursday, we come at you live with the, the news, what's happened over the weekend, what's happened since yesterday, um, and really just share the state of the world according to the home service industry. And then we go into a main topic with our special guest. So tonight we are so excited to welcome Krista Quarles. She's the former CEO of OpenTable and the former CFO of Nextdoor. So she's here to break down the new needs and buying habits of consumers in the age of COVID. And she's also going to be sharing the method of radical candor and effective employee feedback that is absolutely critical to your success as an employer and a boss. And she'll be tag teaming that with Mel, who has a lot of great information for you tonight. So we will be getting to that right after the state of the world with Mel. Um, I'm going to cut to you, Mel, for our state of the world news update. And we'll be back with Chris. I'm just going to spotlight you. Great. Thanks. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Melina Fairley, Senior Vice President of People at House Call Pro. So please do feel free to call me Mel. Um, we do come to you live Monday through Thursday at 5 p.m. Pacific. So we give you a brief daily recap on what's going on in the news related to coronavirus, and then hopefully bring you really great actionable guests and commentary and a bit of inspiration and community. So by way of introduction, if you haven't joined us before, I am not a doctor or a reporter, not an expert in infectious diseases. I am a human resources professional with over 20 years of experience. I spent 15 of those years as the head of recruitment and development at Trader Joe's. So customer facing businesses are definitely my passion. I'm also personally a homeowner and a mom of four kids, several of which just got kicked out because they were being way too loud in the other room. And I'm a proud Marine Corps wife. So with that said, here is your evening update for Monday, May 11th, 2020. The Johns Hopkins dashboard is reporting over 4.16 million global cases and over 285,000 deaths to date from COVID-19. There we go, there's the update. And yeah, there you go, 1.45 million recovered. So that's the, the green number there that we, we like to look at. In the US, there are over 1.34 million confirmed cases, over 232,000 um, recovered, and over 80,000 deaths as of this afternoon. So looking at the landscape, Canada appears as though it may have reached a plateau and potentially passed its peak nationally, so that certainly would be good news. Here in the US, um, COVID-19 has been found in the White House. So two White House officials and other staff recently tested positive. Katie Miller, who's a top spokesperson for you, our Vice President Mike Pence, tested positive last week. She's married to Stephen Miller, who is a senior advisor to President Donald Trump. One of the president's personal valets also tested positive. Today we heard that the staff in the West Wing must now wear masks unless they're seated at their own personal desk. So that's definitely a change. We also have some, some high profile um, folks self-quarantining. So Dr. Robert Redfield, the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Dr. Stephen Hahn, the commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration, and Dr. Anthony Fauci, the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. So we have definitely been hearing from several of these folks publicly about um, the COVID-19 pandemic. So even they are at risk of potential exposure there. So they've all been self-quarantining. We continue to hear about social distancing, the pros, the cons, stay at home, stay at home orders. Um, and apparently, according to a recent poll, a majority of respondents, 71%, still support stay at home orders, but that has dipped since the last survey. Additionally, a majority of respondents, so 55%, disapprove of recent protests against these restrictions. So we, we seem to be a bit of a country divided these days. Um, the restaurant industry, as we know, has been hit incredibly hard. So I know this is particularly close to Krista's heart um, and as is the food industry to mine. So what we are seeing is in a survey by the National Restaurant Association, the US restaurant industry lost an estimated 25 billion in sales and more than 3 million jobs from March 1st to 22nd. 
which is a staggering number. And additionally, sadly, 3% of restaurant owners have already permanently closed their restaurants. So now as states begin to reopen, the owners of these restaurants face a dis difficult dilemma. So open your doors again or remain closed and wait until reopening is more, is more back to normal or is safer. So the decision is complex with questions about safety and liability for staff, for guests. You know, also whether or not you believe your guests are going to come back, you know, how many employees to bring back. So this is certainly a difficult dilemma for, for restaurant and food services right now. Yeah, I feel like employees are also going to have to face whether they're going to come back or not and how safe do the employers feel, or the employees feel or the employers make the employees feel. So there's going to be a lot of kind of back and forth on that. And you know, obviously unemployment um, mm -hmm. assistance is at an all time high right now. So you're faced with additional um, questions there with, you know, I'm going to get paid more not to come in. Why would I come in and put myself at risk? Yeah, this so is we're going to see how that plays out a little bit. We're going to talk more about that today. This has been an incredibly hot topic. I mean, I've literally had some of you in this group reach out to me through Facebook on the weekend talking about a particular employee situation that is challenging where you're looking for someone to come back. They're, you know, not feeling safe or they're making more on unemployment or both. And I know we've talked through some of those situations here. So tomorrow, the U.S. Senate, um, a committee there will hold a hearing to discuss appropriate measures to relax social distancing. So this hearing titled COVID-19, safely give it, getting back to work and back to school, is going to provide the senators an opportunity to question several high profile members of the COVID-19 response group. So we'll certainly report on that here if we get any updates or new direction um, from, from those talks. And Roland, it's Monday, so you've got something special for us? I do, I do. So real quick, everybody, for those of you that are new here, we've got this, what we call the Trades Health Index. This is data that's aggregated across our entire platform, and it shows both a trailing and a leading indicator here for you guys. So the trailing indicator here is how many average jobs are scheduled per week. The blue line is 2019. The red line, as, as you can guess, is 2020. And so you can see here still we are below um, 2019 levels, um, but we're seeing a great trend kind of coming back up. And although it's not very, well, it's kind of V-like, it's kind of got more of a U kind of a belly. You'll see here on um, this indicator right here, the jobs completed per week also coming back up. So for those of you that want to take a look at this, we'll post a link, but you can sort by industry. So which particular vertical and also by state. So that way you can match your gut feel of what you're feeling in your business. Does that match the data that we're seeing? And maybe are you doing better or are you doing worse? So this is updated as of today. And so you'll be able to come back in and take a look at those stats. Um, we also have more stats across countries, average canceled jobs. There's all these indexes. So this gets updated weekly for you guys. So you guys can kind of check the pulse of what's going on in the trades. Awesome. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, Roland, for our state of the world news update. So we are now going to get into the main portion of our programming. I am so excited to welcome Krista Quarles on um, as our special guest tonight. So Krista has quite the impressive and inspiring resume. It's like so cool. So just to name a few is she's the former CEO of Open Table. She's the former CFO of Nextdoor, something, a platform that a lot of you probably use. So let us know if you use Nextdoor in the comments. We're going to be talking about the comparison between the restaurant industry and the home service industry and some key learnings from there. Um, and before that, she's also an ex-Disney VP, I think. S SVP. SVP, but <laughs> oh, that's way cooler. <laughs> X is the SVP. So uh, tonight, Chris is here to talk with us about really the state of the consumer and what you need to know um, about their new buying habits. And then we're going to pivot and also talk about uh, employee feedback. And that's going to be between um, all four of us, but really Mel's area of expertise and also Chris does. So let's dive in. All right. So thanks again for coming on here, Krista. We're going to talk a little bit about those topics. Plus, we're going to talk a little bit about peacetime versus wartime mindset. Um, obviously, this has been kind of popularized in the Silicon Valley, but it applies everywhere. Um, ben Horowitz has written quite a lot about it. But obviously, with the situation we're in today, I would love to hear kind of your explanation and how you see those two things um, and how our pros can learn and maybe um, use some of the tactics um, from, from both sides, irrespective of the situation we're in today. 
Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for having me um, on the show, on the, I guess, show. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Um, you know, I, and, I, and I just, my heart goes out because I know what a difficult time this is and has been and will continue to frankly be for uh, the small business. And you know, I think it was during my time at Open Table that my deep love and affection for the small business owner came to be. And um, I recognize what an important part of our society they are. You know, the fact that over, you know, roughly half of all Americans are employed by a small business. And so I look at it as really the engine that makes our economy grow and run and turn. And if small business isn't working, America's not working. And so, um, and so, you know, you fast forward to today, and I don't think anybody could have in any way, shape or form predicted the radical change in you know, our lives, our behaviors, the, the notion that sometime in February that we would have been locked down, shelter in place for this amount of time. Um, you know, we use the word unprecedented, we keep using the word unprecedented and it feels yet, you know, I think it's still important to say that. And so I think what you're seeing are um, a real shift and change in behavior in terms of how you think about how you're gonna run your business. And we were just talking about, you know, wartime versus peacetime CEO. And so the peacetime CEO has the time and the space and the energy to think well into the future. You know, we often talk about, you know, getting over the, the first horizon. So the thing that you can see, but then we're going to look out to horizon two and horizon three and think, oh, what could my business look like? if I invested in this area, or if I maybe opened a few new locations, or if I added some geography, well, that all goes by the wayside when you're in wartime. I think it's, it's oftentimes it's, how do I get through this week? You know, I, I spoke on a, uh, a travel related podcast and you can imagine the travel industry has just been decimated. And, you know, the CEO of this company was like, I got to Friday. And, and I think there's a real change in, the motivations, the activity and saying, okay, I've got to figure out what payroll is going to look like. And so I think the, the key thing to do is if you can, as a wartime CEO, yes, you're having to behave really tactically right now here for the moment, but are there any, you know, is there anything that you can do right now that potentially when you start thinking about your business in the future will also pay dividends there? And so, um, you know, I'm reminded of the sweet green CEO who um, is in the restaurant space, obviously, and they've, you know, their entire in-store business has been decimated, but they're thinking about, oh, well, we wanted to do dinner. Now we're just going to do it really fast. And so they're, they're making changes that they thought might have taken six months, nine months to kind of think of, and they're just rolling it out because a, they need the revenue, but B, they're, you know, they're, they're in a situation where they're hoping that they can just make it to tomorrow. But this is something that they think, well, it will still be good for our business a year from now, two years from now, so it's still worth doing. So I think the trade-offs that you need to be thinking about are, yes, you know, what's going to help me get to Friday, but if it also helps me get to Friday and next year, then maybe I should prioritize that item over these other four things that I feel like I should be doing. And I, and I appreciate just how overwhelming it is. I, you know, was even listening to NPR and heard um, the CEO of Farm Girl Flowers, really small flower operations gearing up for um, uh, Mother's, Mother's Day. Day. And, yeah. You know, as she said, she filled out 21 different applications for PPP, finally got approved, but probably spent 200 hours. And I think there was, again, this trade-off of do I spend 200 hours on this application for a loan that I may or may not get? Or do I spend 200 hours trying to keep my business alive? Because if I don't make it to Mother's Day, I'm out of business. Um, and I think it's a, it's a tough trade-off, but I think to the extent that there's like, it's a yes and. Yes, it makes me to Friday. And I, um, I could see how this could help, you know, the longevity of my business, you know, maybe a year out. Yeah, I feel like that's really great advice. And obviously, you know, when you think about what is a, like, a, like a peacetime CEO, all of our pros are CEOs of their own little businesses. And when you're in peacetime, you really think about putting the right protocols in place, the systems in place, and then improving and improving and improving. And then in the wartime CEO mindset, you got to be willing to throw in the book. Like, you know what, we're starting all over. We're starting from scratch, which you just mentioned, which is like, you know what, we've been not thinking about dinner, but we're just doing it, you know, and let's get everything in place and go run with it. So I feel like there's definitely that kind of that play between the two that um, I think now more than ever, a lot of our pros are feeling. 
And I think the important thing to remember is that consumers can be really forgiving right now. They know it's hard. They know it's really tough out there. They're willing to accept something less than. So if there was a piece of your business that you were thinking about trying or, you know, giving, giving a shot at and even explaining to, to your you know, customers, hey, like, we don't know if this will work, but this is, you know, COVID time. So we're going to try it. And I, and I think what you're finding is people, are, you know, what, what's, while this whole experience is really hard and challenging, what's good about it is watching everybody sort of come together collectively, that there's like global, you know, there's forgiveness around, oh, this isn't going to work right. We're all standing in line at the grocery store. We're all, we're all experiencing these things in a different way. And I think that, you know, if you have ideas now is the time for also extreme entrepreneurship. <laughs> you know, if ever there was a time, this is it. And so if you have ideas, you know, and you have the capacity to try something out, you know, put, put something out there and see, see what the response is because you'll get people to, to really think and, and, and appreciate and have just so much more forgiveness for something that may not be perfect, perfect the way that you might have wanted it to be. And yeah, we are something... definitely seeing that people want the small business to survive, right? Like you're here with us because we asked you to, right? And you're, you're, you're spending time with us instead of spending time with your family to talk to the small businesses. We had the CEO of WD40 who sent us a pallet of product for us to give away to small businesses. So this is the time, like you said, to, to be um, inventive, but know that people want, want you to survive. We all don't want to see, you know, Main Street gone. We, we like our small businesses, it's, it's very American. And our small Sorry. businesses are inherently local. You know, I think that's one of the similarities between, you know, I think Open Table, which is really just local restaurants and, and you know, the majority of the diners in those restaurants were local members of the community. And so it is really, you know, the health of the community will then drive the health of the business that's underneath it. And so this is also a time for small businesses to come together, to drive referrals to one another, to, you know, help somebody else who's out in business, you know, on, actually it was on my next door feed. I noticed um, there was unfortunately one restaurant in our neighborhood that got broken into. So they lost all their computers and all their systems. And it was the restaurant next door who in theory was a competitor, um, you know, put a note on our next door said, Hey, if you can, get their takeout, get their, you know, get buy a gift card. Like they, they were supporting them because it was their next door neighbor. And so I think it was this idea that, you know, we've got to come together as a community. You know, if our local communities aren't strong, then our small businesses can't be strong underneath them because these are the people who are buying, you know, in that small business. So I think it, you know, all things all do become local here. And I think it's really been both encouraging to, to watch these groups come together. Yeah, and you really just drove it home, which is like the importance of community just in general. It's obviously why we put this show together as well to help our community of SMBs. And even if there is another carpet cleaner or another HVAC right next to you, there's a lot that can be learned and shared between the two of you because ultimately, you know, that, that rising tide floats all boats in the, in the long run. So um, Barbara was on last week and she had really um, mentioned how you guys really need to look at other industries for ideas and innovation. Obviously, you know, you spend a lot of time in the restaurant space. There's so many close analogies. There's so many things that they've gone through, um, both from, you know, the, the situation we're in, but also just a change in consumer preference and the way that they interact with these restaurants. So maybe there's something that you know that our home service providers um, would, would like to hear a little bit more about just how has that changed from, you know, when you first started um, in the restaurant side of things, how has consumer preference changed and maybe how is COVID really accelerating some of this yeah. even faster than we thought it could? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the full service restaurant obviously has been completely decimated and, you know, Open Tables put the data out on it and, you know, people are just not willing and not feeling comfortable to eat in person again. And I, and it is unclear where it is going to go. I mean, I think you said at the beginning, 3% of uh, restaurants have already closed. There's some estimates it could be as high as 75% um, because guess what? It doesn't work to have 25% capacity in a restaurant. The, the business metrics don't actually work if you cut that down because rent is such a high percentage of the total uh, cost in a small, you know, in the, in the restaurant p &L, um, might be different in your p &L. I think one of the biggest transformations, frankly, in the restaurant industry though, was how the consumer chose to interact with the restaurant over time. When Open Table started, there was no such thing as an online reservation. And so picking up the phone, calling the restaurant was the only way that you could make a reservation. 
And over time, what happened is as the technology improved, as the technology both inside the restaurant and as consumers got more comfortable with it, the idea that now that you would pick up the phone and call to make a reservation seems crazy. Of course, you just go online, tap, 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 boom, I know I can see all the restaurants and all the availability and all the times. And so why on earth would I waste both sides time? Oh, by the way, I can also make a reservation at two o'clock in the morning when you're not open and you're not able to pick up the phone. And so what gradually happened over time was that consumer preference changed pretty radically to prefer the online interaction. Yes, there were times where a phone call might have been necessary if you wanted to make sure that the flowers and the cake was there for Mother's Day, which we were not able to celebrate yesterday. Um, but even then, there's ways to do that to exchange those hospitality notes inside the system. And so what's been interesting to watch post COVID is been the, the, the radical, radical transformation of what consumers were willing to do before COVID and after COVID. And, you know, I, I always marvel at, you know, I, um, you know, my, my dad has passed, my mom's like really can't even, you know, she doesn't even have an email account, but I've watched other friends whose parents couldn't even text maybe a month ago are now ordering their groceries online and prefer to do so. And so normally this kind of consumer change would have taken three, four or five years and all of a sudden it just happened in two months. And so it's really been interesting to watch are how different and how quickly consumers have adapted to this new distance experience. And I think the big question for your pros is how are they adapting? Mm -hmm. How are you taking what has been a major shift in both e-commerce and just, you know, how, how are you, you're getting your information, how you're getting your goods um, to maybe how I'm going to think about HVAC, HVAC for the summer. And so I think that's a big, big change that I think we're still catching up to, but it's, a, it's an important question to ask because I think you're going to see a lot of the preference change and, you know, how much are willing, people going to willing to be doing in person versus over the phone. And I think a lot of that is changing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've always seen and kind of preached about, hey, online booking is coming. We see it in our data. It is just growing, you know, 50% month over month, which is just insane. So we've seen that happen. Obviously, now what you mentioned is, you know, how can you do this contactless? So we see virtual estimates um, spiking. You know, people are doing this. Everyone's got Zoom. When you tell someone like, hey, can you hop on a Zoom? They're like, oh, yeah, sure. I got it. So it's becoming a verb. And that's when you know, like, it's really sticking with, with people and it's changing things. Um, so if pros aren't looking at it or before you're like, I don't know about online booking, now is definitely a time to do a page from what the restaurants did years ago and kind of start applying some of these things to your business, especially now. And I think, and I think the older consumer is also getting a whole lot more comfortable. Yeah, We've always definitely. known the millennial consumer is there, but you know, maybe the millennial consumer doesn't have as much money as the 60 year old plus person, but I think they're all willing to do it. And you know, my son got stitches in the middle of this. I didn't think I'd be able to do virtual doctor visits, yet we've done it. And I was like, that was way better than running down to the, to the doctor's office. So I think it's, even myself, it's, it's upended a lot of my preconceived ideas about what needed to be in person and what, not, what didn't. And I think everybody's you know, coming to that same conclusion. Wow, there's a lot, a lot that we can get done. And so when I'm in person, it's gonna be very specific and, um, important why I need to be there in person. And it might just be to get the job done versus, you know, getting an estimate or getting the sale closed. Mm -hmm. well, and those of us who are taking care of older Americans, you know, or older people in general are insisting that these things be virtual. If you're going to go into my grandmother's house, I am going to make sure that there's not an in-person estimate. I'm going to make sure that there's a virtual estimate. I'm going to make sure that she does not have to hand you a check because that's what she would want to do. We literally packaged and sent my 93 year old grandmother who lives alone in Pittsburgh from San Diego, one of our old iPhones and did a whole slide presentation that we printed <laughs> of how she can use the thing so that if something like that were to happen, we were trying to figure out how, how would we make sure that, you know, she, she is completely safe. And so making sure that she had technology and she signed up for Facebook two days ago. And it's like the cutest thing that's ever happened in 26. So it's happening. It's happening. 
I mean, I don't even book anything if I can't do it online. If I have to call and figure out when you're open, like what services you have and the price of it, and we're going to get into that here shortly, you've lost my business because there's 10 other restaurants or businesses down the street that I can just go on at 1 a.m. when I'm supposed to be asleep and book it that way. So continuing on with this topic of the shifting consumership, consumership and consumership um, and the shift in the consumer funnel. Um, in addition to people being more open about like receiving things virtually and just being more technologically open, what are some other notable things that you've noticed about the consumer um, that our pros should be aware of and be catering to? I mean, one of the, I think, really important trends is where you live matters 10x what it used to. And so people are nesting like they never have before. Um, there's a company called Wayfair that sells furniture online. And they just reported their first quarter you know, business results and it was through the roof. And I think what you see are people, you know, they want a good and fair price, but they are also outfitting their homes in a way that they never had before. They're creating a home office. They're caring about, you know, they're turning a garage into, you know, maybe a, a desk space. And so um, I think the nesting phenomenon is going to continue to play and people want their homes to be nice. However, as you probably have read in the news, 33.5 million people have filed for unemployment over the last seven weeks. And so as an economy, we've just honestly never seen anything in any of our lifetimes of this magnitude or velocity. It is, it is remarkable and my heart goes out and hopefully it's temporary. Hopefully when we get back to work, a lot of these people will, will also be able to, or when we get back you know, from sheltering, we'll be able to get a lot of these people back to work. But I think price and communication and transparency around price are going to be really important. Um, you know, I sit on the board of a company that helps, it's a consumer lending company. And one of the things we've learned is that if a consumer understands what something costs or that they can afford it, they're more likely to engage with it. So if I have no idea what it costs to maybe get a new HVAC system, or I, you know, if I'm, I'm thinking about putting in some, you know, new plumbing or something, and I am just, I'm, I'm probably not going to engage and I'm not going to connect if I have no idea what that price is going to be. And so I think that there's, there's two pieces here. One is transparency around something, what something costs. And people are forgiving. They understand it's going to be arranged. Maybe you have to get in there. Maybe you have to figure out exactly, you know, maybe there's some unique aspects, but just give them a ballpark that sort of gives them a sense. Should I engage or should I not engage? And then I think the other thing to keep in mind are just kind of the range of, of prices that, that you know, people are gonna be willing. You know, again, if this is a tough economy, maybe they want the more entry level options and making those understandable and available to those consumers who you know, may not be able to afford more. And I think that's gonna help people engage with a broader array of services if they have a deeper understanding. Because this is a scary time for a lot of Americans who are trying to just figure out, okay, what, you know, where's the next meal going to come from? Where am I going to, um, you know, how am I going to engage and, and things and in, in business is tight, but, but yet I'm spending all this time at home. So I want to make sure home is good. And so being able to invest appropriately, but with clarity and transparency, I think is the key. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. On that price point, I think Roland, you can add some color here. Um, one of the biggest topics that we see in all of our Facebook communities is the, do I put my pricing or do I not put my pricing? And if you are on the fence, like you heard it here first and you'll hear it again from us, now's the time to put your pricing. I'm first of all, not going to waste my time with someone who doesn't have anything online um, and I can't book them online. And I'm not going to waste my time with someone who isn't upfront about their pricing. Even if you show me that range, um, that is something we see a lot, right, Roland? I couldn't imagine going to a restaurant with just a menu with no prices on it. Yeah. I'd be like, so what are we spending tonight? I don't know. That's super weird. And so you see that on yes, some yes, things, and you don't want to, you don't want to book in those restaurants, the ones yeah. that are still withholding. But you also get rid of the price shoppers too. So if someone sees your price and goes, you know what, I can't afford to spend that. I'm not going to engage in the conversation. But to Chris's point, maybe because I do see the price, I'm like, oh, wow, that's, that's, 
that's a lot less than I thought it was, or that's within what I can spend. So let's have the conversation. Whereas before they're like, I don't even know what it's like. So I'm not even going to bother booking or calling and wasting my time. So showing those prices is huge guys. And I, and I would just double down on how, how anxiety producing that experience is yeah. for a consumer. Cause nobody wants to ask and then feel like, Oh, you know, I've been totally, you know, yeah. out of market. It's like, again, going, going into the restaurant and they've got the, the market quote, there and you're like okay how much is the fish of the day yeah and you know it turns out it was like 65 dollars and you were hoping it was 30 dollars or something and you're like shoot now i feel like a jerk and so there's so much fear i can't even get over how much fear and anxiety there is at the consumer end when they have to ask and understand and then you know this idea that like am i is that the same price? Is everybody getting the same price? And so it's just, it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing issue where it's like, if, you, if it's more upfront, if they can know it ahead of time, they're much, much, much more likely to engage. Absolutely. Like you mentioned, they're a lot more forgiving too, you know? Oh yeah, I understand that, you know what, if you've got a crazy duck system and you got to replace the whole thing, it's going to be more money. There's not unrealistic expectations mm -hmm. around that. I mean, how many times have you guys been sitting at a restaurant um, or and maybe they bring out the drink menu and there's no prices on the drink and I sit there and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm either not going to be able to order a drink or I'm going to pay $35 for like a soda or a glass of wine and it is just completely anxiety ridden in all aspects. So as home service professionals, don't do that to your customers. They'll pay you. You just have to let them know how much it cost. Um, on, and one other thing you said last week, Krista, when we met, was um, the importance of giving the customer some breathing room. Can you explain what you mean by this to our to our audience? I mean, I, th I think that there's, um, you know, I think there's there's this time around, you know, like, do I have to make a decision right now? Do I have to like choose right away? And I think it's it's giving them the space to to let the see what it is, understand, and then come back. And I think it can be scary because you just want to get the job done and you or you just you know you're trying to load them up and you're you, you know and, and I think how you manage your day and your time and so when you think about it there's like you know how do we get new customers in the door and then how do I service the customers that I've already gotten in, in the door and I think you know making sure that you're giving space to both so you just want to kind of move them on in and through the system but but I think you know getting giving a giving a little bit of breathing room around getting that information to the customer and then letting them come back because they often will mm -hmm. um, I think that is super important and uh, the last thing I want to ask you about um, on my end is the new way of establishing trust. We briefly talked about we're all touchless now. You're doing those virtual estimates. You're doing online booking. Um, the old way of establishing trust was through shaking hands. What, what are pros supposed to do now to establish that brand trust and relationship with their customers? Yeah, I mean, I think this this is you know a lot of companies are trying to figure out you know what what do I how do I establish trust trust when I used to you know go in and look you in the eye and that, that was how we established trust before, but if you think about it, it's not too different than you know a bigger company trying to build their brand and so what this you know what our my recommendation is really letting the consumer know a little bit more about you. Like, how did you start your business? One of the things we always recommended um, on the restaurant side was, you know, don't just have your Instagram profile be a bunch of pretty pictures of food. Have it be a photo of, you know, closing time, you know, shutting down the restaurant, the exhaustion, what it takes to run and build and drive your restaurant. We always used to say, you know, they're putting dinner on their table by putting dinner on your table. And I think there's something about people want to see the humanity that goes behind the story. They just don't want to see the face of the, you know, the, the pro and the machine. They want to know the human being that sits behind it. So any way possible that you can convey, you know, anything about your life, you know, that you've been in the community, that your kids play the local sports, that there's something that ties them both personally to your story so that there's a level of connection and frankly trust i mean all that builds trust because they understand and under appreciate what you're doing every single day and i think sometimes i think there's a little bit of fear of showing the behind the scenes uh, but actually what we've seen is that when you show a little bit of the the challenge behind the scenes the two kids
kids, you know, running through the, you know, the, the garage that you're trying to do with auto repair or something like that. Like that gives people a sense of connection and belonging that actually over time and, you know, virtually says, Hey, there's, there's somebody real at the other end there. I trust them immediately. Cause that's, you know, for good or for bad, that's how, that's how the future is going to be here. And I think we're going to have to figure out how to build your brand. And a lot of what the brand is, is really a, an authentic connection to the consumer that they believe what you're doing and they believe that you're an honest you know business professional and that they're going to want to go get their you know professional um you know done experiences done with with one of you and so i think that's a really really important thing to think about yeah and that's kind of like simon sinek says you know so it's more about the the why not just like the how or the what like you know, I just serve food. Okay, great. You serve sushi. Well, I can get sushi anywhere. How do you serve it? I've got a really great chef. Uh, I don't know. Okay, maybe, maybe I don't know. But like, why? Because, you know, we've got into the business because we had the best sushi experience in Japan. And we made sure every American in the world has to like try it. Something like that. Um, but think about that, pros. We'll probably go in that in another week. Yeah. Oh, that was just, if you wrote one thing down over the last 35 minutes, that was it. About what you're going to be posting on your Instagram tomorrow. So I hope that you all really listen to Krista, because if you can read lips, some of you may have seen me shoot to the left and yell, kids, quiet. Hopefully that's <laughs> fast enough and then unmuted. But they just, they're sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. And when they fly through the house, there's really nothing I can do to hold it back. So um, authenticity right here <laughs> on display. Um, I'd, I'd love to switch topics with you, Krista. So um, viewers, if you've got questions about what we've been talking about so far, make sure you put it in the Q&A and then upvote them. Put that thumbs up so that we can get to some of your top rated questions at the end because we're gonna change topics here just a little bit um, to something that has to do with trust and has to do with caring. So we're gonna to change topics to radical candor. So the term radical candor has been commonplace in um, employee development worlds where, where I spend my time um, for a while now. And it comes from the best-selling book of the same name, Radical Candor by Chris, I believe your, your friend and colleague, Kim Scott. So what a treat that you're here. Um, the book has an awesome subtitle, but I'm gonna let you share that. So first, before we dive into it a bit, um, can you just give us a brief overview of the content? Well, I think I have one on my shelf. Uh, yeah. There you go. You got to see the subtitle. <laughs> I think I got one right here. Um, this is, you know, radical candor. Be, be a kick-ass boss without losing your humanity. Um, I, I didn't. I didn't know I was going to pull that off the shelf. <laughs> um, but but as you see, there is this like you know this like two by two grid. But um, and really, what it is is um, is. If you think about, you know, the what we call the horizontal axis is how much do I want to get stuff done? Like at the end of the day, if you're not getting stuff done, you're not in business, you know, uh, necessarily for charity here. I mean, you've got to get stuff done. But the um, the vertical axis is how much do I care for you personally? Um, and and so what she calls radical candor is that upper box of I want to get stuff done, and I care about who you are as a human being. And if I quickly go through the loop, the, the bottom care corner is, I want to get stuff done, but I don't really care about you <laughs> at all. And she calls that a obnoxious aggression. Uh, you know, not to, not to um, use any uh, swear words, but that's where your a-holes <laughs> go. Um, uh, and then there's the, I don't care about you and I don't want to get stuff done. And she calls that manipulative insincerity. Like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm playing games mostly. But then she, you know, I think this is the, really the most important quarter is um, um, I care about you, but I don't know how much I'm going to get stuff done. And I think a lot of companies fall into this trap of being nice, but not kind. And she calls that ruinous empathy. And I think the, the point of all of it is business is hard. Yeah. And you have to be able to have hard conversations. And not, nobody was really fully trained in how to have these conversations and nobody has like the perfect guidebook about how to do it. 
And so a lot of times what you find is that people shy away from the hard conversation. It's just easier to have no conversation than to have the hard conversation. And the whole idea, and, and you know, even you know, as somebody who, you know, I, I grew up, uh, I was the sixth of seven kids out of, outside of Pittsburgh. Um, and so like, we, we didn't, you know, we were sort of raised by wolves. And so I always like joke, like I didn't have any of this background, but you know, if somebody sat you down and said, all right, we're gonna have a conversation. Often what happens is your whole, like I call it lizard brain takes over. You're like fight or flight. Oh my God, something bad's gonna happen. And now the minute they start talking, you can't even hear them because you know, you know that they're gonna come at you with some sort of criticism or issue or something. And so it's, it, it blocks you off from being able to really hear what the feedback is, make a change, and then contribute meaningfully to the business. And so all Radical Candor really is is, I'm going to speak to you as if I'm almost speaking to like my child or somebody that I've got your back and I want you to be the best version, the best employee, the best whatever, but we've got to have this difficult conversation about how we move forward. And what often happens is, you know, people need to know and believe that you care about who they are as a human being. They care about their, their lives outside of just the office, that you care about whether they have a sick parent, you care about whether they're, you know, they have kids at home or what's going on. And then you're able to have a conversation with, you know, kind of gracing humanity along the way. You know, this is a very difficult time. I've had friends who have had to lay off half of their employees. And that is a very difficult time because they're almost, you know, sometimes in some of these businesses too, it's almost like they're, they're family. And so the idea that laying somebody off is so traumatic and oftentimes they don't want to have the conversation. So they have kind of an ugly version of the conversation or it's too abrupt versus saying, you know what, you came here, you came to work for the last three years and you gave it your all and what you did mattered. And it was a huge contributor to the growth of our business. And guess what? Times are tough right now and I really wish we could have a different outcome, but I can't make the numbers work any other way. And so I can't, you know, we can't have you work here anymore. And if, at the end of their, you know, their, her conversations, with the employees, they even said thank you after being laid off. And you think That's about amazing. that kind of an exchange, it's so difficult, so trying. And yet because they brought a level of humanity, because they cared that the employee brought value into that equation, it ended up in a very different place. And so I think, it, you know, what I would just encourage everybody to do is, is think about, you know, how are you connecting with your employees, you know, in a, in a true kind of emotional level, because that's going to give you the power then to have, you know, more of those difficult conversations that ultimately, hopefully advance your business forward. I, I love when she talks about it's like caring personally, you know, knowing someone and caring about who they are and challenging directly. Growth is, a, you know, a partnership, right? So if, if, if I care about Alexa and I care about, you know, her performance and her growth and her family, I'm going to let her know when I think she could be doing something better. I'm going to let her know when I think she's doing something exceptionally well. And I'm going to tell her specifically what it was that I really like that she's doing and what I want her to keep doing so that she can stay successful. So it's both the, the radical candor can be both praise and criticism, right? You, you give the criticism only works because you've, you've, you've gotten to know them, that you care about who they are and they right. think that you've got your back. And so when that, when I get the criticism from you now, I'm like, you know, it's because I just want you to be the best employee that you can be and the best, you know, worker that you can be. And, you know, look, my kids, I've got two boys and, you know, when we give them feedback, it's, you know, <laughs> they inherently know it's because like, I know you can do better. I believe that you can do better. And, and so here's why and how and what you would be able to do. And, and so I think the challenging directly is successful because they feel like you've, they've, you've got your, their back. Yeah. One thing I challenge, like a lot of our pros grew up, um, you know, being athletic, um, and, you know, think about the best coach you ever had, even when they were just like yelling at you, they spend the time with you off the court and all the things to help you get to that better place. You're like, you know what? Yeah, totally. They're yelling at me, but I know they're just, they know that I've got potential. They're just trying to get me to that next level. And a lot of our pros can kind of feel 
um, feel that directly in terms of how would I express that maybe potentially to another another pro. But what Mel said too, which is like you have to build that up. You, you said the same thing too, Chris. That you can't just come out of nowhere and just say these things. You have to develop that trust. And a lot of times on one on ones, you know, when you have those one on ones, ask questions about their personal life because that makes you really embedded in you know caring for them personally beyond just the work aspects. And I'll share one story, and Chris, I want to get your reaction to this. So in management training at House Call Pro, we've done nine cohorts of management training, and we do an exercise about feedback. And one of the questions we ask is, you know, tell me about someone who you enjoy, actually enjoy getting feedback from, the person that doesn't make you, make you shake. I used to have an employee where if her previous boss was so mean to her that the first time I asked her, like, hey, you got a minute? She said, should I go get my handbag? <laughs> no, who hurt you, right? But they talked about, so, so we make a list of who do you like receiving feedback from and why. And the why was more about this person cares about me. This person has my best interest at heart. And yes, there were some in like, they, they give it directly. They just give it to me. They don't do that weird sandwich where I'm so confused. It's a positive <laughs> and negative and two more positives. There was some of that, but for the most part, it was, the person giving the feedback is the person that you believe is looking out for your best interest and truly, you know, cares about you as a person. So, you know, how do you react to that? I, it's unscientific, nine sessions of management feedback. And, and here's the theme that I pulled out. Well, I mean, I think it follows the line, you know, but, but also that the person giving the feedback is, is knowledgeable and that they're really, mm -hmm. you know, they're trying, they're not just, you know, trying to be a boss or a manager. You know, I think it's, it's that they're saying like, look, we're going to get you to the next level. And in order to do that, you're going to need to make adjustments. I also played high school and college sports. I used to joke, I tell my kids all the time, I'm like, be careful when the coach stops yelling. It means, you know, he or she doesn't care anymore. Um, you know, I think, I think you, you know, when somebody cares, whether you are making progress in your, you know, career. And, and I think there's one version, which to your point is just berating or yelling. And there's some people who definitely do that. And, that is, I, I and, and the reality is, I just don't think it's as effective. Like there's, there's, there's two paths and, and I'm always trying to find the result. I just want to get to the place where I get the better result and screaming at somebody and yelling at somebody. It just doesn't get the result. It doesn't get the result. Like that's why people don't spank their kids. Like it's a, it's illegal and appropriate, but it just doesn't get results. Like kids learn that it's not going to be effective over time. And so I think the key is you are going to get a better result with your employees if they feel supported, but also pushed at the same time, because now they can you know, evolve out of their comfort zone. Yeah. Think of your own reactions and how clear, you know, your abilities are when you have trust with the people in your life versus when you fear them, right? We don't get our best ideas, our best work. You certainly aren't going to get the best out of me in a day's work if I'm afraid. But if I trust you, I'm going to go to you when I've made a mistake and I'm going to say, hey, boss, <laughs> something happened, right? If I fear you, I might not. I might hide it. And so that, that radical candor of, of caring personally and challenging directly and being willing to connect with your people on a personal level will definitely create trust and create better business outcomes for customers and employees. Well, and also if an employee feels unsafe, they're literally, they become dumber. <laughs> they can't make good decisions. They, like the brain anatomy is such that you can literally not make a good decision. Whereas if they feel safe and they feel supported, now they're in a good, a better place to make a good decision. So it, it, again, to me, it gets all back to, you know, dr driving the result. Right. And I can see that questions have definitely been stacking up here. So Alexa, I want to make sure we, we, we are managing our time well. Tell us, tell us well, where to go. First, I want to say, Mel, you're the one who taught me that I'm in cohort nine currently <laughs> of management training, and you're the one who taught me that you could have positive feedback. Um, <laughs> I didn't know that before I was one of those employees who are like, hey, can I give you some feedback? I'm like, well, no, <laughs> no, I don't want it. I'm sorry. Um, and I've, I've actually implemented that into my everyday life as like a very junior level manager, and it's just helped in my relationships too. So that has been one of the best things I've learned this year. I think we started this year. I don't know what day it is. I don't know what <laughs> month it is. Um, but let's go ahead. We have some really awesome questions. Our first one um, for you, Chris, is from Cynthia Tavia. What problems in your business have you experienced that have shaped the woman you are today? Well, um, and you mentioned woman in there, so I, I am a woman. <laughs> um, and I will say, you know, I have, I've always worked historically in pretty male-dominated environments. 
And um, one of the things that was surprising to me was just how much I, because I thought like I had to be, it was in these male dominated environments, I had to sh kind of show up as a man, to be per perfectly honest. I had to be like, I, I you know, grew up um, kind of in pretty aggressive working environments. And I thought that I had to swear and tell jokes and do all these things. Um, and what I learned throughout the arc of my career was that I was just not as effective when I showed up as somebody who I really wasn't. And I think the, the key for me was actually um, really my open table experience where I was finally the boss. And that was one of the things that finally did allow me to just release all of those historical um, preconceived notions of who I needed to be and who I needed to show up as. And so just started showing up exactly as myself. And what I learned was I was 10 times the leader um, when I wasn't trying to be a version of what I thought a successful leader looked like. And so I think that's been a big change in evolution in my own leadership was just, I'm actually better, better as a leader when I'm not trying to be some better version of a leader that I thought was the, uh, the ideal version of leadership that was out there. It's a good lesson. Um, let's see, Roland, do you want to ask our next one? There's so many good ones. Yeah, there are really a lot of good ones here. So, um, Michelle. So this is a, this is an interesting question because a lot of our pros are next door, and they're always asking about next door. Um, and because it's so hyper local, and because of the times we're in, it's affected. So her question is: I've always been reluctant to get involved on next door as a handyman service because it's a little too close to home. Any advice around that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's you know, if if you actually, I mean, the, let me take a minute to describe what Nextdoor is in case you are not on it. But um, what it's done is is it's sort of drawn like ring fences around neighborhoods, and these are bu designed by the neighborhoods neighbors in the neighborhoods themselves. The neighbors decide what the edges of the neighborhood are, and so you have what I would call like the micro neighborhood that is your close in distinct neighborhood, and then there's like this patchwork of neighborhoods that sit around that sort of hit your like near what they call nearby neighborhoods. And if you're a handyman in one of those like neighborhoods and you're servicing them, you're also going to see all of the other issues. And you, you also might get complaints uh, about your service in that neighborhood. And so I can imagine, I, I understand the, the genesis of that question around, you know, how do I manage? I mean, the good news is, and I've, I haven't been an expert in a long time, so I, um, I you know, I, I and probably a little bit out of date, but but essentially they've they've created a whole business side. So you have a business profile and a business persona. So I think the key here is to keep your home persona and your business persona distinct to a discrete degree. And and I think what's the nice thing about Nextdoor is that so much of the um, connection to pros is word of mouth. Uh, so I know, for example, I found a guy to put fencing up in my yard because I got a dog and so like you know as one does I need to uh could not could not go through COVID without a pet um but um you know like they I was able to put fencing up and and I got the recommendation from somebody in the neighborhood and knew the neighborhood and and I think that it was a, a remarkable way of getting connected and people want to know you know what what they've shown at least in data is that I'm a lot like my neighbor, what my neighbor wants in a home, what my neighbor likes is probably a lot what I like. So there's an immediate trust if my neighbor or three of my neighbors say that they like this pro. And so I think it's been a, a really helpful way to gain immediate trust for the services that you're offering. So I would highly encourage you to try and, and check it out. Um, I'm sure that there's lightweight ways to kind of dip your toe in the water, but um, there's also favorites in a neighborhood, so you can become part of that. But I, I, I you know, I, I can't give you specifics on on how well it's working today. But I know that when I got there, that was that was the idea behind it. It goes back to your key message, which is just trust and transparency. And because you're a part of that small local community, you know, it's really encouraged to just engage. Um, and then also, if you screw up, um, that's okay too. Everyone's human. Just make sure you do the right thing and try to do the, the right thing because they will talk about it. Um, so if you're a pro and you're not on it, you should definitely go get on it because it's a great source and only increases referrals. And I hear that all the time. And to your point around screwing up, I mean, I think we experienced this at Open Table too. Like, you know, like there's sometimes where the meal does go wrong. 
And what was most frustrating was a consumer that just yelled and there was no chance for the, the restaurateur to respond. And so I think what people again want to be able to do is say, hey, we want to make it right. We want to have the conversation. And sometimes, look, we get that there's complete edge cases where there's that 1% consumer or that 1%, like that's not what we're talking about here. The 95% of the ex exchanges are really like, honestly, people just want to be able to have um, a direct conversation and, and being able to connect. A lot of them, by the way, are because the, the, the pro didn't pick up the phone or they didn't pick up the phone. So <laughs> you can, you can actually <laughs> satisfy a lot of angry customers just by enabling digital um, uh, booking and, and, and not having to have the phone be the gateway into your business. Well, I, I've got a question that's, that's close to, to my heart. Um, so women especially are juggling so much with kids out of school. Um, burnout is something that we hear about in career and life in general, but these days people are stretched thin, parents are stretched. Um, you know, certainly moms are stretched. There, I was online with a teacher today who I also realized was parenting and homeschooling her own six-year-old while she's consulting with, for, with me for my eighth grader and my mind about exploded. So how do you, how do you get through times of high, you know, stress and competing priorities? How do you combat it? What do you do personally? What can our pros take away um, to help all of us through, through this time? What, what has worked for you? I think the first thing is to acknowledge that you are not alone. This is a time of extraordinary stress. You know, I was watching um, a study, it was just chronicling 700 college age students from January to now, and it showed that a huge 40% of them were experiencing almost like PTSD-like symptoms. So this, this time has been really hard and traumatic. And while there's everybody's physical health, there's also our mental health, our financial health. I mean, so there's other degrees of our health that are being taxed right now. I also have two kids. We're homeschooling. It's crazy. Um, and I think so the step one is to, you know, if you can find other people who are in similar situations to just I don't know if we've over zoomed ourselves, but like getting on and feeling like you can connect with somebody else so that you know that like you're not crazy and you're not alone and that your challenges and traumas are probably being felt. So, so often when the burnout comes is it feels like you're the only one who's experiencing it and you're the only one who's having challenges. Um, but there's also a physical aspect of this. We're working harder, we're, you know, we're working longer. There's no division between work and home anymore. You don't know where the job ends and where it begins. And so I think that's also meant that we're always on. And so figuring out a space or time to, you know, I, I, I've been trying to do a home yoga practice. It's not been great, but I try. Um, but is there something both physical that you can get to? So I would say like, first for me, I tap into my community and the people around me to make sure I feel like I'm connected and not alone. And sometimes it's just sharing stories of what's bugged me this week or not. And then there's the physical aspect of like, do I have energy? Can I, you know, make sure that I'm, my body's in shape because this stuff is hard and it's physical and it's challenging. And so what do I need to be able to do there? Um, and then, you know, I think it is, you know, if you have, um, you know, somebody to, yeah, to, to kind of talk through that, that, and, you know, if there's, you know, more and more people are trying to do meditation practices. Um, you know, we sometimes my kids have challenges falling asleep at night. So we'll use like calm or something where they've got sleep stories and things like that to try and because once the kids go to sleep, then then <laughs> we can, can relax again for a minute. And so again, like are there tips and hacks to, to help other people in the family and maybe even yourself fall asleep at, at night um, to kind of take the stress down and, you know, kind of get into and out of frankly your head so that you can, you know, really calm your body so that you can gear up for the next day. Yeah. Uh, I, I love the calm out, by the way. So it's great, <laughs> especially the rain one. I, I too, Krista, have been attempting to have my own yoga practice here. My cat loves it. I do not. Um, and also meditation in the morning has been helping. Um, uh, on it, like getting involved in our community, you said like right now, community over competition. So what are some ways that you would suggest getting for our pros to get involved in their local communities? Um, yeah, I think it's really important. I live in California and, you know, I'm involved in um, a program called No Kid Hungry and because uh, 7 million kids in the state of California can't get lunch right now. And so it's, it's a pretty challenging time. And so what I've observed is when businesses use their own creativity and entrepreneur, I'm, I wouldn't tell you guys how to get involved in communities, but I would say back to this idea of 
how do you build trust? When I've seen my um, kind of local businesses do things from like, you know, like the other day I bought a meal and I also bought a mask from the company selling me a meal and they were going to donate you know, the portion of that mask price to their local charity. And so again, it made me feel better about buying that meal from the restaurant, but it also, you know, gives you a reason to stay connected. I think you guys, what's, what's amazing about this community is just how creative and entrepreneurial they are, but it goes back to, gosh, I'm going to trust that pro because, you know, I saw that they were connected and giving back. So if it's, you know, if it's snap lunches, if it's masks, if it's other things, I mean, imagine, you know, just all the creativity that could go along with it that will, you know, at the end of the day, yes, you're doing a good thing, but also, you know, you might be building trust for a potential consumer down the road. And I think both are fine and, you know, perfectly good and also authentic. And I think it's about finding what is that version of community for you as a pro to say, hey, this is this is something that I could really get behind and support. And it feels authentic. And oh, by the way, when I tell potential customers about it, they're, they're going to find greater level of trust in what I do. That's really helpful. I think more of a pros need to be more involved, especially now, because you're planting seeds that will grow for later and you'll cash in on that later too. So don't expect to do things, a whole bunch of things now. And then, you know, suddenly next week you're fully booked. No, this is going to take months and years and it's going to establish a brand. So one thing that I'd love to ask our guests, Krista, is you came on, you, you shared a bunch of golden nuggets to our pros. Who is someone that you know in your network that would love to participate here and drop some knowledge in our community, in our pros, uh, for next time. Uh, that is a a good question. Um, I'm trying to think of uh, who's, uh, you know, I mean, my my friend Lee. She runs a local children's clothing company around here. She was, you know, she was. Um, she might be an interesting one. I've got some others in the um, kind of restaurant industry, like a Dan Simons, who um, he's a. He's a CEO of Founding Farmers, and they tr they went from having thousands and thousands of people come through their restaurants every week to they shifted immediately to driving an e-commerce business. So people would pick up packages, they'd pick up pre-made pre food. They even had a distillery on site that they transitioned to making hand sanitizer. So um, no more no, vodka. Alcohol they didn't sign yeah, so they literally like, they, they had all the, you know, the, the component parts. And so instead of making Bloody Marys on a Sunday, they're making hand sanitizer on a Monday. So um, he might be a really interesting one. It just Sort of came to mind as I was saying that. I like um, that one. That's going to be a good story. Uh, I'll, I'll connect that transition. Great. Well, Krista, thank you so much for spending um, part of your evening with us. Our thanks to, to your family as well. So we'd like to leave our audience with one challenge from our special guests. So if you were to give them advice on what one thing that they can wake up and do tomorrow, just that one step, what would you encourage our audience right now tonight to wake up tomorrow and just do one thing? I think, you know, what we said earlier about like, show them, show them opening or closing time on your Instagram feed, show them what it's like to like, you know, turn that crank day in and day out and show that little bit of humanity and let it shine through because we all know the people behind these businesses are fantastic. Mm -hmm. That was that was my biggest takeaway for me tonight too. So thank you. Um, and we see a lot of thank you, Krista. Thank you, Krista. I just ordered your book. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us tonight, everyone here. Um, we have an awesome lineup for the rest of this week. Tomorrow we have Billy Yeadon from John Don. We're coming in to talk all things like sanitation um, and really demystifying the things you should be doing right now, things you might be hearing. So that is tomorrow at five. No matter what industry you're in, you do not have to be in cleaning. It is helpful for all. So we'll see you tomorrow. I just posted the link to our Facebook group as well. Krista, feel free to join if you'd like um, our, our uh, home service Facebook group. And other than that, we will see you guys tomorrow. Thank you for joining us. Thank Bye. you. Good night, Krista. Good night, Krista. Bye, everybody.